So great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to break out of the silence hello rock point it is so great to see you today if you are still out chatting out in the foyer, we invite you to come in and join us. And a special welcome to those of you who are online who are joining us today as well. Thank you for joining us. So my name is Sharon Fraze. This is my first time hosting, so I'm a little scared. Um, <laughs> my husband Terry and I have been attending Bow Ridge on Saturday nights for about 12 years, I think. And I am probably better known as Nathaniel, Shaylin, and Grace's mom, and now Marcella's mother-in-law as well. So woo, that's exciting. I don't mind uh, being known as their mom for sure. And speaking of young adults, <laughs> there are the, uh, many of our young adults are away at a spiritual retreat this weekend, which is very exciting. We have a very vibrant young adult uh, program in our church. So we're going to pray for them a little bit later in the service. So also, I wanted to show you, this shirt is a Camp Camasol shirt. Terry and I were out volunteering at Camp Camasol this week, and some of there were some campers that were there with us this week, so yay, it was so fun. So we are actually exhausted, to tell you the honest truth. <laughs> you forget how noisy 90 junior hires can be, like really 24-7, it was a bit much, but... It was really good. I just want to stop for a second, though, because Camasol, if you don't know why that camp is named Camasol, you think that is a really weird name. So I wanted to just stop and explain that for a second. So Rock Point is an alliance church, um, but 
it belongs to a bigger organization, which is called the Christian and Missionary Alliance. So if you just take the first couple letters of each of those words, you come up with the word camisol. So there you go. For those of you who didn't know, that's why it's called Camp Camisol. Um, and it was our first time out there. And I just need to tell you that I was so impressed by the quality of the, the volunteer staff and the programming out there this week. The young adults who were the counselors and the program people were just incredible, really, really good quality people. So they are out there mentoring our kids into being people who love Jesus with all their hearts. So if you get the chance and you haven't sent your kids there and you get the chance, I would highly recommend that. And also, I think I saw Pastor Ron in the building somewhere. He's not here right now. There he is. Just yay. <laughs> So Pastor Ron has been given the go-ahead to get back to his normal life and routine, so we are so thankful for that, and we just wanted to say thank you to those of you who have been praying for him over the last, which I sure feels like many, many, many weeks. So anyhow, so good to see you tonight. We are here together today because we are followers of Jesus. At some point, Jesus said to you, come and follow me. And some of us, we just jumped right off the boat into the deep end, and we're just following Jesus right away. We're so excited, there's no stopping us. Some of us are kind of testing the waters a little bit to find out if Jesus is trustworthy, if I really should follow him or not. But I want to encourage you today that Jesus is a faithful and trustworthy friend. And following him is the best decision that you could ever make in your life. So we are going to worship together today. And I'm just going to pray as we start the service. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful that you are a faithful and trustworthy friend to us. And I just want to invite you to our service today. We need you in our lives Many of us are carrying burdens that are just too heavy for us to carry ourselves. We want to give them to you, invite you to speak to us here in our service today. In the powerful and precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. There's power in the name of Jesus. It is right. Why don't you stand and... Listen to Psalm 148, verse 3. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. All of creation is instructed to praise God. Recent photographs from the James Webb Space Telescope have been able to give us an idea of how vast and amazing the created universe is. Scientists have now concluded that there were 10 times more galaxies, just like our own Milky Way out there in the universe, than previously thought. Trillions and trillions of shining stars, the majority of which only God can see giving praise to him and, um, you know, praising God throughout time. That's what I wanted to say there. With that in mind, let's join with all creation to give praise to the one true omnipresent and omniscient God.
pleads our case with the righteous judge. We may imagine the conversation going something like this. Father, I know this one has sinned and violated our commands. He is guilty as charged. However, you have said that my sacrifice is sufficient payment for the debt that he owes. My righteousness was applied to his account when he trusted in me for salvation and forgiveness. I have paid the price so he can be pronounced not guilty. There is no debt left for him to pay. Jesus is our advocate and remains our advocate forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ, I stand, oh.
until he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand here in the power of Christ we Thank you, worship team. I'm going to invite you to be seated now. We're going to uh, partake in communion together tonight. And you should have been, or today, we should have been given one of these on your way in. If you um, have a gluten intolerance, there are options of those available. And for those of you online, hopefully you had a chance to get um, your bread and cup together. Otherwise, my apologies for not giving you the heads up. But um, this week, as I was thinking about leading in communion, I got thinking about that word communion, thinking about how com commune, community, communion all have the same root word. And what is that? What, what does that mean? It means to share together. And I think one of the most important things about sharing in this tradition is the doing it together part. This is the last thing that Jesus did with his disciples, was to share communion with them. And I think he knew that he was setting up a church, a church that was going to be facing a lot of challenges, persecution and difficulty and grief and heartache. But he knew that in our coming together, we would be able to encourage each other. And the church has been doing this for 2,000 years together. And I think that's part of the reason that it has survived and it's as strong as it is today. So as we take the bread and the cup together, we worship him and thank him for the life that we have because of the death that Jesus experienced. So there's two parts to this little cup. <laughs> and the first thing we're going to do is the bread, and then we're going to sing a little bit more, and then we're going to do the cup. So it's a little bit confusing. I'm going to be honest with you all here. And it's just the first little cellophane part. Don't take the foil part yet, or you'll spill your juice. So just the cellophane part. Okay. So this is the bread. And there's a lot of symbolism about bread in the Bible. There was the manna in the desert, and there's the showbread in the tabernacle, lots and lots of bread in the Bible. But I think it all points towards Jesus, if you're really going to, if you want to do a study on bread sometime. But Jesus said, I am the bread of life. In John 6, verse 51, he said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If a man eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I have given for the life of the world. And there is life in following Jesus. So this do in remembrance of him. Let us partake together. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what your word crucified laid behind the stone you live to die rejected and alone 
trampled on the ground you took the fall and thought of me above all. Let's open our cup. For those of you old enough to remember this song, David Meese used to sing a song called We Are the Reason. And he said, we are the reason that he gave his life. We, me, you are the reason that he poured out his life so that we could have life. Lord Jesus, we're so thankful that you died for us. Let us partake together. Students from grade kindergarten to grade five are invited to go down for kids' church now. So, so before Brandon comes up to preach, we just want to take a little bit of time to pray together. So let's uh, just close our eyes and pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness to us. We want to thank and pray for the young adults who are off on their retreat this weekend. Lord, we pray that you would be very real to them there, that you would meet them where they're at, that you would speak through the people that are sharing, that you would be an encouragement, help them to grow in their faith there this weekend. And Lord, we also want to pray for members of our congregation. There are a few that have 
experienced very significant loss in the last few weeks. And Lord, our hearts break with them. Lord, we ask that you would comfort them, that you would walk with them, that you would be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Lord, that you would give them wisdom to know how to deal with the many things that are going to be coming up here in the next little while. And Lord, give us as a church body, help us to know how we can reach out and help them and support them at this time. Lord, we would pray that your will will be done in our lives. Help us to hear your voice and to learn how to surrender our plans for the plans that you have for us. Lord, help us to be men and women that you intend for us to be, to be the salt and the light of the world. Keep us from all the distractions that this world has to offer. And Lord, I just pray that you would anoint Brandon and give him words to speak. Help us to be receptive hearers as well. We ask all this in the powerful and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers with the church, for we who teach will be judged more harshly. Indeed, we all make many mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. We can make a large horse go whichever way we want by means of a small bit in his mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go. Even though the winds are strong, in the same way, the tongue is a very small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Last week, uh, Pastor Duane brought us a harrowing truth from Jesus in Matthew 7. Not everyone who thinks they are Christians are saved. This can cause a lot of angst. 
But Jesus did not leave us wondering if we're Christians who only think we're destined for heaven or if we're some of the believers who will actually get to spend eternity with God. He told us through his brother James's letter that those who are true disciples will see their lives changed and their actions moved by faith. Today, we're going to look at what could be considered part two of this message. Last week, we focused on what our faith does to what we do. This week, we're going to look at what our faith does to what we say. Now, we're going to be diving pretty deep into the passage that we just heard. It's not an easy passage by any means. The message is clear, but James uh, uses a number of metaphors, and it's easy to get lost in the pictures that he's painting and forget what he's actually talking about. So we're going to take this passage one section at a time and see if we can pull out exactly what James is getting at. Starting in verse 1. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. Well, that's a lovely verse for a brand new preacher to start with. <laughs> but it is a great reminder, not only for us pastors, but for everyone who is in a position of leadership here at the church, whether we are on stage as preachers or hosts or worship leaders, or for off the stage leading small groups, Bible studies, or outreach events. The eyes of the congregation and the community are on us. This highlights an important aspect of leadership roles in the church. They are highly visible and carry a lot of influence. And if we ever take that influence lightly, we run the risk of leading the flock astray. Now, having recently finished the ordination process just a couple of months ago, I can speak firsthand to the vetting process that our pastoral leaders go through before we are allowed to take senior leadership positions in the church. The church and the denomination want to be sure that those who are going to teach have solid theology and teaching ability because questionable teaching can lead people away from the truth and from faith. I moved my page and I lost it. There we go. But, okay, some of you may say, that seems very judgmental. Shouldn't we have grace for our leaders, especially when they lose their place in their sermon? <laughs> yes, we should. But Jesus also said in Mark 9, 42, if you would cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone hung around your neck. Jesus thinks it would be better for you to be dead than to teach something wrong that leads people into sin. This is serious business, and we need to take our influence seriously. Now, we're going to come back to this in a second, but let's move on to the meat of this passage. Verse 2. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. Now, here we get to James's thesis statement, his big idea for this passage. If we were able to control what we say, it would have such an impact on our lives that James claims we would be perfect and in complete control of ourselves. Now, who doesn't want that kind of control? Who wouldn't want to set their mind on something and then follow through completely each and every time? I know I would. Many times I have set out to be a kind, compassionate, and controlled parent only to find myself snapping at my kids later that day. I've set out to be a better father only to have my tongue get in the way. Or how about the times I've gone to say something hard to someone only to let the fear of rejection cause me to stay silent? This isn't the kind of control that I want in my life. Now, maybe this isn't you, but I suspect that each of us have had the experience of saying something that we promised we weren't going to, or of speaking in a way we later regretted. Even when our temptations are more action-based, such as vowing not to eat any of the pie left over from family dinner last night, only to later eat both pieces of pie that were left over, we usually step over the line from temptation into action with phrases like, well, just this once, or you know, it doesn't really matter, or I thought about working out, so the calories are gonna just balance out anyways. We use our words to convince ourselves that whatever action we wanted to control ourselves from isn't actually that big a deal. But really, 
how does controlling our tongue help us keep control over the rest of our lives? James continues in verse 3, We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. Here, we have two images that show how small objects can influence the direction of much larger objects when applied in the right manner. Both would have been everyday pictures for those living in ancient Israel. Anyone who traveled by horse or who saw somebody riding a horse would have known that the reins and the bit helped the rider keep control over his mount. That small bit, when properly handled, gave a 100, 150 pound person control over an animal that is four, six, eight times his size. In the same way, a rudder would have been a common piece of equipment for anyone who sailed the seas. Fishermen, sailors, traders, all would have known the importance of a rudder in controlling a large ship. But how does that connect to our tongues and what we say? Let's try something, just a little experiment. Everyone close your eyes for just a minute. Take in a couple of deep breaths. Just sit in the silence for a minute. Water. One word. And how many of you started to think about water? Cups of water, puddles of water, lakes, rivers, streams, oceans of water. One word, and I was able to direct the thoughts and minds of dozens of people in this room and those watching online. One word from one man, and I've influenced the direction of everyone else's thought life. Now, keep your eyes closed for a second and breathe again. Just sit in the silence. You are loved. How does that make you feel? What did that do to your state of being just now? It's three simple words, 11 letters, three syllables, and so much power. Now, you can open your eyes again. Do you see why James started this passage, reminding everyone that teachers are to be held in a higher, to a higher standard? When you use your words regularly to influence people, the power can be used for good, for the trivial, or for evil. And it's here to the evil that we're going to turn to next, starting in verse 5. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. Now here we have more metaphors and images. Just as the bit can help make a horse useful or a small rudder can steer a large ship, so too can a tiny spark cause an entire forest to burn down. That one momentary flash of heat can cause the destruction of hectares of wilderness. We see this year after year as the smoke from the fires in BC or Washington State blow into Alberta and blot out the sun. The influence of that one spark reaches far beyond what we think that it should. James is saying that we, what we say has that same kind of influence. One unkind word can destroy entire relationships, whether we mean it to or not. Now, have you ever had someone say something offhand to you that you didn't like? Uh, for, Perhaps they commented on your work, or how you looked, or, or how you parent. The conversation ends, but you're stuck thinking about that one phrase over and over again. What did they mean by that? Did they really just attack me like that? I thought we were friends. How could they say something like that to me? I mean, don't they know how that would make me feel? You spiral into frustration and anger, perhaps taking it out on your uh, your feelings on those around you, ruining your family's day and, and causing widespread destruction. Meanwhile, the other person has moved on, unaware that the damage of their careless words, what it's caused. Now this sentence, it can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself is vivid. It's even more so when we understand the Greek language that undergirds this this uh, English translation. Here, hell is a translation of the word Gehenna. This was a real place, a valley just outside of Jerusalem where the unfaithful kings of Israel, of Judah, 
in the Old Testament would sacrifice their children to foreign gods. Now, we believe that in Jesus' time, this valley was used as a garbage dump where trash was continually burned and disposed of. So here, James is calling our tongues, when uncontrolled, literal dumpster fires. Verse 7. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Just as our words can bring destruction to relationships, they can also bring death. We can speak life to people, lifting them up to the Lord, bolstering their spirits, or we can speak death, crushing people's souls with criticism, complaint, and nagging. Why didn't you do what I asked you to? Why aren't you more like your sister? I can't believe you would do that. You are worthless. You are useless. I don't have a son. Words can be weapons. Painful, destructive, life-stealing weapons. And we wield them most often when we are hurt ourselves. We might not strike with our fists, but how often have we struck out with our words? I believe this is why Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, 22, but I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. That hell is the same Gehenna we talked about. The flaming garbage heap that sets our tongues on fire. This is the image that Jesus uses for God's punishment. So, we need to be careful about how we speak to others. Or the flames of hell may pass from one person to another, causing death and destruction wherever they go. Now, we have one final passage to look at before we get to our takeaways for today. Starting in verse 9. Sometimes it, our tongue, praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a, water, a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No. And you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Have you ever heard the phrase, you kiss your mother with that mouth? That's the gist of what James is getting at here. One of the big accusations against Christians these days is our hypocrisy. How can we speak life one moment and death the next? How can we say we are people of love and yet actively speak hatred against anyone? How can we say we love God, yet tear down people who are image bearers of the Most High? Now, this generally doesn't happen in nature. Bodies of water are either fresh and good for drinking, or they are salty and not good for drinking. Fig trees grow figs, and if you're looking to make wine, you've got to look elsewhere. Yet, we think it's okay for us to praise God and curse those who bother us or disagree with us. Now, I'm going to make some people mad right now, but it's important and I need you to hear me. We have every right to have opinions and to disagree with people about vaccines or masks or homosexuality or abortions. We have every right to debate to defend our positions, and to fight for justice and truth. But we have no right to dehumanize those on the other side of the conversation. We have no right to insult those who disagree with us or to threaten their lives or their loved ones. We have no right to make others feel unsafe in our presence or online. Threats will not draw people to God, and hatred will not help spread the gospel. We must be a people known for having taken control over what we say, even when others around us speak hatred, are heated, are unkind. And this just doesn't just encompass the words that come out of our mouth. We must have control over our Facebook and Instagram posts, our texts and emails, our tweets and our TikToks. We must treat each other with love and respect, even through our screens and devices. 
Now, some may be feeling that uncomfortable nudging from the Spirit as you remember how you've been acting online. Maybe you're feeling really defensive, angry at me. That's fine. Just send me a heated uh, communicate card. Then I know you weren't listening. <laughs> I encourage you to spend some time in prayer with Jesus about this very thing. Don't take my word for this. Take his. It's way more important. But throughout this passage, James has been clear that we can't have this kind of control. He has pointed out again and again that our tongues are evil and poisonous. And if this is true, which, since it's here in the Bible, we claim it to be, how can we do anything about it? In Matthew 19, the disciples asked Jesus a similar question. They said, then who in the world can be saved, they asked. Jesus looked at them intently and said, humanly speaking, it is impossible. Humanly speaking, it is impossible. We can't do this on our own. But Jesus continues, but with God, everything is possible. We can't clean up our words on our own. We need Jesus to do it. We need to give, him our, to give our words to the Lord and ask him to make our speech holy and pleasing to him. We need Jesus to put out the fire of Gehenna that fuels our tongue and to replace it with kindness, gentleness, and purity that comes from the Spirit. And I promise, if we turn to Jesus in faith and ask him to change how we speak, he will do it. It might be a slow process, but the more you think about it and pray about it, the more he will show you where you might need to be silent or to say something that you would rather not. He will remind you that his spirit is in you, empowering your words to be life-giving rather than poisonous. Just as Pastor Duane taught last week that a truly repentant disciple will start to act differently, so too will a truly repentant disciple start to speak differently. So here, today, I invite you to join me in repenting of evil words and commit to allowing the Spirit to guide everything we say. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we are sinners whose tongues need to be cooled by your Spirit. We confess that we have spoken curses, hatred, and destruction to those you love. We want to live more like you, bringing life wherever you send us. Help us to repent, to change, and to be noticed as people transformed by you. We give you our voice and influence. Use it according to your will. Amen. In this passage, James has taught us about the importance of what we say. How we act and live out the gospel is vital. Our hearts, empowered by the Spirit, must be kind, compassionate, and loving. But perhaps the way we most often show what is in our hearts is by how we speak. Several weeks ago at our All Sites Outdoor Service, Pastor Dave spoke about the connection between what is in our hearts and what comes out of our mouths. As Jesus taught in Luke 6.45, a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. Say that again. What you say flows from what is in your heart. So, invite Jesus to continue his good work of changing and filling your heart. And see what that does to the words you speak. In conclusion, I want to challenge you this week to pray about what you say. Type and text. I want you to take a few seconds before you speak to think about whether what is about to come out of your mouth is life-giving or death-giving. Before you hit send on a text, email, Facebook post, Instagram post, or tweet, ask if this message is honoring to God or if it is just giving vent to your frustrations and anger. We will mess up. We will snap at loved ones or let our frustrations get out of control. When that happens, I encourage all of us to be quick to ask forgiveness, both from anyone we've hurt and from God our Father. Now, summer is the perfect time to slow down and check on how we are speaking to one another. So slow down, be kind, and as your mother would say, watch your mouth. Blessings, Rock Point.
Well, thank you, Brandon. Um, yeah, that was great. James really doesn't mince words, does he? And uh, either did Brandon. So uh, that's so good. And um, I don't know about you, but I don't want there to be anything that I say ever that um, that my Heavenly Father wouldn't like, that he wouldn't approve of and wouldn't want me to say himself. Um, just as we conclude our service um, this evening or today, um, we really just want to uh, respond with worship. And uh, we're going to sing a song that we did at uh, the outdoor service a couple weeks ago. It's called um, I Speak Jesus. And um, it's a really, really beautiful song about proclaiming the powerful name of Jesus uh, over our lives, over our families, over our community. And, um, and so as we sing it, I, I just want you to feel free to, um, to respond the way that the Holy Spirit leads you to, whether that is doing what Brandon encouraged us to do, um, reflecting upon, um, our, you know, your own speech or just allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to you, allowing the Lord to convict you. Um, or you could stand and you could sing and just praise his name. Or you could do a mixture of both, whatever you want. You are free in this place uh, to listen to God's voice and respond to it. And um, so we're going to sing this song together. starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom, I speak Jesus, your name is power, your name is power, your name is healing, your name Break every stronghold. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. I just want to speak. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over fear. Over fear and all. with me. Let's sing. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name. Jesus. Oh, Jesus from the mountains. Jesus from the mountains, Jesus. 
Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy for my family, Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name of Jesus. Oh, shout Jesus from the mountains, shout Jesus from the mountains. Oh, Jesus in of my heart be pleasing to you O oh Lord my rock and my redeemer let's pray Holy Spirit in the coming days and weeks teach us and remind us to speak words of truth encouraging others loving others and bringing the good news to a broken world in need of your redemption may you be glorified as we seek to use our tongue to speak life to those around us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I love that song. I never heard it before until that Family Fun Fest, and I have played it constantly. In fact, Alexa said to me the other day, I know, I know, I speak Jesus. So, <laughs> not really, I'm just kidding. Um, but there really is power in the name of Jesus. You know, we said, I said today when we were doing communion that Jesus is the bread, the bread of life. He also is the light of the world. And darkness and light can't be in the same place. So if you have darkness in your life and you're carrying burdens, you can speak the name of Jesus. There's power in that name. I don't know why, it, how it works or what it is. Maybe it's because Jesus made us and he loves us more than anybody. But when you say his name, the darkness flees. So if you're going, I challenge you if you're going through some darkness to speak the name of Jesus. There's power in that. Or play that song. <laughs> Um, and Brandon, thank you again. That was really good. And I know I have said things that as they're coming out of my mouth, I'm like, ooh, shouldn't have said that. So Lord, help us to be people that have fresh water springing from our hearts so that our words reflect that. Just a couple of announcements. 
There are local REACH trips happening. Uh, the, we have summer interns, and they are leading REACH trips on Wednesdays and Thursdays, all the way until the end of August. So these are opportunities to go and serve in the community. They go to different places, like Bethany Care Centre and the Calgary Pregnancy uh, Care Centre, places like that. And we do different things depending on what the location is, but these are open to uh, really the entire family. So we're gearing them towards our youth and our kids, but if you as a parent or an aunt or an uncle or as someone who a parent says is okay to tag along, <laughs> you can come along as well. We'd really encourage you to do that. You can register on the Church Center app or online, those kinds of things. It's $30 a person. Um, they start at 8 o'clock. So anyhow, check that out. I know that the youth interns have been working really hard at that, and they would love for you to come. Another thing I'm going to mention, they didn't tell me to talk about this, but I'm going to anyways. Um, space Camp on Tuesdays at Bow Ridge and Wednesdays at Bear Spa from 1 to 3 for our kids. So this is a great opportunity again for our kids to come and be together and learn about Jesus and have some community together. So um, the only other thing is I know uh, most of you probably give either online or automatically, but if you want to give tonight and you don't participate in that, there is a little black box you can put your offering in or go on to the Church Center app or online as well to do that. For those of you who joined us online, thank you very much for being here today with us today. Um, we would love to see you in person sometime too, but online is awesome as well. So, we have had church. Now we can go and be the church. Thank you. <laughs>